Hey, welcome back to part 3 of this series. Just in case you stumbled upon this video, this is part of a three-part series about building this cargo bike. And I finished the bike in the last video, so this one is just a follow-up video covering some stuff around this build that I couldn't fit into the other two videos. So I'm going to show you how I made my custom frame jig and explain how it works. I'll cover making the two blocks you saw in the last videos. We'll take a closer look at the fork. And I'm also going to show you how I made the cover boards for the cargo bed and there will be some additional info and answering some questions about the bike. So let's start with the frame jig. So here's all the stuff the jig consists of. I keep saying the jigs I use are very simple because this is really just a bunch of aluminum T-slot profiles as well as some 90 degree connection brackets and some T-nuts and screws and the only thing I made myself are those aluminum cones and the big post you see in the background that holds the bottom bracket. So to make the cones, I had to get out my top slide, which I rarely ever use since I built the solid tool post. But turning the cones is one of those things where you actually need it, and luckily it fits next to the other tool post. I'm making these from a piece of 60mm aluminum round stock, because I want the cones to be big enough to fit large diameter tubing, and the angle of the cones is 60 degrees, which should be steep enough of an angle to ensure the tubes properly center themselves on the cone. So the process of turning the cones consists of a lot of back and forth on the top slide while I'm backing out the cross slide a little bit in between the cuts. The reason I'm cutting on the back side here is just that the top slide was easier to position this way and it also puts the hand wheel in a more convenient position. And speaking of the hand wheel, I eventually got tired of all the hand cranking and used the classic poor man's power feed here by rigging up a battery drill to the hand wheel. Once the taper was done, I also turned down the outside a little bit, and this is mostly to create a reference surface for setting these up in the jig later, which I'm going to show you in a bit. And for that process, it's very important that this feature has the exact same outside diameter on all the cones. Once this is done, the part then gets a hole in the center for mounting it, so I'm using my favorite new addition to the lathe, which is the ability to drill using the carriage. The part also gets a counter bore here for the screw head and then all that's left is to part it off which is one of the things where I need to use coolant because the parting blade likes to jam otherwise. And then the round bar gets cleaned up and the whole process starts all over again so I did this four more times to end up with a total of five cones. Here I'm showing you the basic dimensions of the cones in case you're interested. So next let's make that big post that holds the bottom bracket. I'm using this hefty piece of cold rolled steel round stock in this case, mostly because I just happen to have it around, but also because I want this part to be very sturdy and very accurate. Not just for using it as a fixture, but because it can also be used as a device to measure all kinds of frames and check them for damage or distortion, and also to fix them by bending if necessary. So the part gets a feature on this side that fits into a BSA bottom bracket to center it, and then the frame later gets screwed against the jig from the other side for which it needs a thread there now. <laughs> 
on the other side I'm creating a stud that fits exactly into one of the holes on my welding table. But I could actually see this general principle working with other tables as well. This is really the only part that gets attached this way, so technically your table would only need one hole to locate this thing. The more important part for this to work is that the table is flat. This side also gets a thread and this is important so the post can be screwed against the table from the bottom to make sure it sits absolutely flush with the surface and doesn't move around in any way. So here's the finished post and now we can already start assembling the jig. This is just 40 by 40 millimeter T-slot profile. You can get this stuff from different brands or make different systems but they all work the same way and the good thing about aluminum extrusion is that it's generally very straight and accurate. So it really lends itself to this purpose. How long these pieces need to be kind of depends on the kind of frames you want to be building and since everything is adjustable the exact length actually doesn't matter that much unless it's too short. One of the extrusion pieces actually gets a miter on one end because it's going to interface with the bottom bracket post you just saw. So the post also gets a hole straight down the center here and one thing that's great about the extrusion pieces is that they're actually designed to have threads cut into them at the ends which is another way you can attach them together, but in this case we'll use that feature to attach it to the post. So once again here's all the finished jig parts, so let's start assembling. There's different types of these T-nuts depending on the system, but they all work the same way. The screw goes in on one side and then you just fumble them into the T-slot, slide them wherever you want, and when this gets screwed down it forms a very strong joint. The other side of the angle bracket gets a vertical piece attached here and then the cones are also installed using the T-nuts. And like I said the profiles and also the brackets are usually fairly accurate. Unless you're building super high-end road bikes or something I think this type of setup offers more than enough precision for most things. So here's the post again. It fits nicely into one of the table holes and this post basically represents the zero point for the entire construction because most bike builders use the center of the bottom bracket as the main reference point on a bike frame and everything else is relative to that. There's other ways of approaching it too but generally that's how I do things. So the long piece of extrusion here is what will accept the C-tube and this can now be set up at whichever angle I want so that means both the bottom bracket position and C-tube angle are determined by this part uh, which gives you a very good starting point to work from. The fixtures for the two head tubes are even simpler, they just have one of those vertical pieces with a cone on each end. So to set the whole jig up for precision I first measure the reference surface that the bottom bracket will be sitting on, which in this case is at 136 millimeters measured from the table surface. So since a normal BSA bottom bracket is 68 millimeters wide, we're gonna add half that to this number which gets us to 170 millimeters, and that height is essentially the center plane that intersects all the main frame tubes. Like I said, this outside surface here is the reference surface to set these cones up. So all the cones are turned to be exactly 58 millimeters in diameter. So now I add half of that to the 170 we just figured out in the last step, which brings us to 199 millimeters. And that's the exact height I need the top of all the cones to be at, so that they're centered to the plane I just mentioned. Setting up the cones is super easy now. I just lock the height gauge and then I just push them up against the measuring surface and lock them down and I also triple checked all of them again afterwards but depending on how flat your work surface is it's probably not necessary to chase hundreds here. The fixtures are ready to use now and they're just free floating on the table so I clamp them down wherever I need them and use the table grid and various angle finders to set them up like you saw in the build videos. And to clamp a piece of tubing in here they just get inserted on the cones and then when you push them together the tube slides to the center and that's really all there's to it. 
I can also mount a frame to the post here, and since that outer ring on the post is the main reference for the frame, this needs to be secured well, so normally the post gets screwed against the table from the bottom to make sure it sits flush and doesn't move. Besides building frames, this particular setup with the post can also be used to check various frames and potentially correct any misalignment. It's not quite as precise as using a real surface plate, but since I measured the flatness of this table, I know this setup is more than enough for my needs. You also might have noticed this little spacer disc before, and that's just an additional part I made that allowed me to get some more clearance down here for uh, suspension linkage frames, which can be pretty bulky in this area. And similar adapters could also be made to work in conjunction with different bottom bracket standards like press fit BBs. Here's what the whole setup looks like now with a normal frame, and if you didn't watch the first build video, you can also check that out to see how I used this to build a cargo frame. And I'm most likely going to add some more parts to this in the future, for other tasks, but for now I hope you get a good idea on how this works and how to make it. Alright, so next let's cover the two blocks. You already saw how these are used in the last video, so I think it's pretty self-explanatory, but let's look at how I actually made them. I started with a bunch of square aluminum stock and cut these cubes off, and I used two different sizes, one for the smaller tubes and a bigger one for the main down tube. After cutting these, they went on the mill and got a reference hole exactly in the center. And then I made sure they are square in the vise and used a face mill to clean up one side of the saw cut surfaces. I'm not facing the other sides because I measured this stock and checked the squareness before starting and since aluminum stock is usually quite accurate, I decided it's good enough as it is and this way I can save myself a ton of work. And then the block goes on the lathe. I'm using my chuck in a chuck setup here again, I know it looks sketchy, but it just works for me. So the hole in the center isn't used to get this perfectly centered here, it's more just to give me a fairly good starting point, so there's a bit less fumbling around with the forger, and then I did eventually use an indicator to get these dialed in, because for these blocks it's important that the hole is exactly in the center. Then I'm starting to drill a hole here, and yes, of course the drill here is going to center itself to the initial center hole I made, but that doesn't really matter. I'm just drilling this hole to create an opening that I can fit a boring bar in, and once I start using that, the hole should come out fairly accurate. So that was one of the small blocks, and the process is exactly the same for the large ones, but for these it did take quite a long time because I had to hog off a lot of material for these huge holes. So that's another block prepared for the next steps, and here's what we got so far. The blocks look really nice, the bars all came out accurate and the surface looks great, so we can go to the next step. So each block actually gets cut in half now, because I don't really need them to be that long, and this way I was able to save myself a bunch of work by having to bore half as many holes. And I did of course make them long enough so that I have a bit of material left now to clean them up before they're brought to final dimensions. I also put markings on each pair of these. It's probably not necessary, but this way I'm later able to use them in pairs again if I want to be extra sure they're 100% identical. Then they go back onto the mill once more with the saw cut surface facing up, and then they get cleaned up again and brought to their final thickness.
but for the large blocks actually ended up using the lathe again to face them mostly because the boars happen to fit nicely onto the outside jaws and also this leaves a nicer surface. Then all the parts get a little chamfer on the outside and last step is to create the actual clamping part. So I'm drilling some holes here which go almost all the way down the block. They also get counterboard and on the smaller ones the outside wall there gets really thin so I figured I'm just gonna cut that away. Then each block gets cut in half again and I made a little setup here with the mag base attached to the saw as a stop so I don't have to line up each block by hand. Once again I also mark the upper and lower part of each block, again probably not necessary since they are fairly accurate, but this way I can group them together the way they were cut if I ever have to. I'm cleaning up the saw cut surfaces again, not really necessary for the function, but it doesn't take long and makes for a more finished product and also ensures both of the halves have the same height. Then I open up the hole here in the upper portion of the blocks and the lower half gets a thread and now they're finally finished. So here's all the finished parts. It was quite a bit of work to make these but as you saw on the build they've served me very well so far and it's probably not the last ones I made. So someone in the comments asked how to make sure the top of the block is actually clamped symmetrically so that the lower and upper surface are parallel. And that's a good question I wanted to answer because it's actually possible to screw these on crooked if you're not careful. There's a few ways of doing this. The fastest one I found is to just use the height gauge again and zero this out on the center of the block. And then I can check on both sides and tighten or back out the screws until both sides are at the same height. And if you want to be extra accurate, this could also be done with an indicator. But that being said, I found that having the tops exactly level isn't really that important for most operations. For the kind of precision I shoot for in a cargo bag frame, just eyeballing this was fine for me most of the time. So the next part involves a bit of problem solving I had to do regarding the fork, or to be more accurate, the fork steerer. As you saw, the front steering pulley gets clamped onto the steerer, but as I built the bike, it turned out this was more complicated than I first thought. So in theory, a 1 1 8 inch fork steerer has a diameter of 28.6 millimeters at the top, and then at the very bottom, 30 millimeters to fit the crown race seat from the headset. So in an ideal world, the steering pulley could look something like this. Just a 28.6 millimeter straight bore that goes down and opens up at the bottom a little bit to allow clearance for the crown race seat. But it turns out it was a bit naive to assume it's that simple. So here's the fork I bought to use with this bike and I'm gonna link this in the description and if we measure the steerer we got the 30 millimeter crown race seat here and then further up it's 28.6 give or take so it looks like it's all fine right? However if we measure at the bottom of the steerer suddenly the diameter changes a bit and this tells us there's a very slight taper down here. Measuring this with the calipers isn't ideal so we can use a better method. I'm putting the fork on the lathe here, and don't worry, I'm not going to actually start the lathe. We're just using it as a measuring device in this case. So now I got an indicator set up here, and if we move the carriage towards the crown, we can now see very clearly that the steerer starts to get ever so slightly thicker towards the crown. It's only about two tenths over 40 millimeters, so you can barely see it with your eyes, but unfortunately, it does complicate things. So to go back to the model here, if I was to build the pulley with a straight bore, it obviously wouldn't work anymore because it either won't clamp properly or it won't even be able to slide all the way down to the crown. So one solution would be to try to replicate this taper and actually turn a tapered feature inside the pulley to make the two fit. 
the problem with this is that you'd have to get this very slight angle here absolutely perfect and I mean down to a fraction of a degree in order to get a decent fit. The long story short I actually tried doing this and I failed. So the first version of the pulley ended up not properly fitting so I had to scrap that. I'm not saying it's not possible to do this right but personally I seem to lack the skills and also the patience to pull it off so eventually I went with a different solution. So on most modern suspension forks the steerer is a separate part that is actually just pressed into the crown using a friction fit. After doing some research I was fairly confident that I can just press out the old steerer and press in a custom steerer which I can then make to the exact dimensions that I need so that's what I did. You do need a hydraulic press for this but it doesn't have to be anything too fancy. I got a cheapo 20 ton press here but you're probably good with about 10 tons and I'll link a video in the description from someone who's got more experience with this than I do and this explains the process very well so I won't go into too much detail here. So I got this tube here that the bottom of the crown will rest on so that's the only surface that has to actually withstand the pressure. You definitely don't want to press against the fork legs because it's almost guaranteed you're going to end up destroying the fork that way. Sometimes the steerers can also be glued in addition to just the friction holding it in so I also warmed up the crown a bit here to hopefully soften any potential glue in there. And then I started pressing. It's gonna look and sound pretty violent in a second when the initial stiction starts to loosen. It also might seem like I'm hammering on top or something, but it's really just the steerer coming loose in small steps. So as scary as that was, the steerer did eventually come out fine and as much as it sounded like something is cracking, I can assure you the crown looks absolutely fine afterwards. So now it's time to make the new steerer and I want to not only make this fit but also make it stronger. So since I'm not too concerned about weight here, I'm using a 30 by 2 mm chromoly steel tube here which should make for a very sturdy steerer. So the fork crowns usually have a bore of 29.9 mm and the steerer has a 30 mm surface at the bottom. So it's a tenth bigger to create the friction fit and since chromoly tubing is fairly accurate this already has the correct diameter for that fit and here I'm just turning down the rest of it by just a tenth so that the upper portion can slide through the crown because otherwise I'd have to press it the entire way which would be quite the ordeal. Then on top this gets turned down to 28.6 again so that the headset and the clamp can be mounted for installing the fork. So here's the old steerer and the new which is just missing one feature now. It needs a shoulder at the bottom which acts as a stop when pressing it in and in the worst case scenario of the steerer getting loose this would also prevent the crown from just sliding off at the bottom. To create the shoulder I'm just going to weld on this ring and then clean things up on the lathe. It looks pretty horrendous right now but we can easily fix that. So here's the finished custom steerer now and you can see the slightly bigger diameter there at the bottom which will now be pressed in. To be extra safe here I'm using this special type of extra strong Loctite. This is not your normal thread locker, this formula is specifically made to join together mechanical parts like pulleys and drive shafts and it should add a significant amount of strength in addition to the friction fit. So I'm applying some of that inside the crown now and we can start to press in the new part. So since the top is slightly smaller it goes in quite easily and the last bit actually just dropped in. And now here's the actual press fit portion of it. This definitely went in easier than the other one came out but it still required a fair bit of force. I think the press was at about 5 or 6 tons here so I'm fairly confident that we got a decent fit because if this went in too easy that would be a bit worrying. 
So now we got the finished modified fork here. The steerer seems very sturdy and since the bore is straight, the pulley also fits perfectly now. As for the crown race, technically this is supposed to go on a 30mm crown seat, so we're missing a tenth here, but it still sits on there without any play, so I'm not concerned about that at all. And if there was a small amount of play, that could also easily be fixed using the appropriate Loctite. Like you saw in the last video, I do ride downstairs with this bike, so this whole setup has proven itself in my opinion. Alright, so let's look at the cargo bag covers now. I bet some of you wondered what material these are even made of, and believe it or not, it's just plywood. Not just any plywood, it's the phenol coated plywood you saw me use in other projects. And I'm cutting out the two halves here and then using some super glue to actually attach them together temporarily so I can save myself a bit of work later and make sure they come out identical. My table saw has the sandy slider here, so you can also use that to cut angles, so doing this was quite easy. And now comes the part which I admit is gonna look a bit stupid both for metal workers and woodworkers because I figured I'm gonna use the milling machine to cut the slots and I'm starting by just drilling a bunch of holes at each end of the slots. Since I didn't have the appropriate wood cutting bit for this I ended up using a two flute end mill here that's normally made for cutting steel. I know that's less than ideal but I just wanted to get done and sometimes you just gotta use what you have. You can see here by the ugly tear out and the burns that the end will start to get dull after about the fourth cut. It almost seems like if you miss appropriate tools for something they weren't designed for at all, it's actually bad for them. But anyway, I just powered through and besides wasting the cheap end mill, this did work out okay overall. So now I can separate these parts again and start to clean up those ugly edges with the handheld router. So here's some more improvisation. I 3D printed some quick little templates again here, just so I don't have to measure out and mark all of these countless little slots around the edges. And then I just used the handheld router to cut all of these small slots. In this case I can just use the edge attachment. So this was relatively easy, just in case you're wondering why I didn't use this machine for the big slots. Because with those I would have had to set up some kind of stop for each cut or build some jig and I figured that takes way longer than just using the mill. After this was done, I also chamfered all of these slots and also chamfered the outside edges and now the boards are almost finished. You might have already guessed it, I actually coated these with bed liner in the end, which just makes sense because this stuff is literally designed to be used for truck beds and it also creates a cool looking functional surface so I'm quite happy with how that came out. Since bed liner is stupidly expensive, I didn't use it for the bottom, I just painted that black with normal paint because it's rarely going to be seen and now the boards are finished and can be installed like I showed in the last vid. So one more thing I wanted to cover here is that I do in fact use this bike to transport things, even though it didn't really come across last time. One thing I really like about this design is that you can both use the lower frame as a big box or basket, but you're also able to place bulkier pieces of cargo on top of the frame, which enables you to carry stuff that's much bigger than the space inside the cargo cage. The cage also neatly fits one of these Euro stacking crates, which I can also screw against the frame here and lock it if I want to leave stuff in the bike for a bit. Of course using a plastic box offers minimum security, but it's good enough for things like leaving some groceries in there while you visit another store. The nice thing about these crates is also that they come in tons of different sizes, but they all interlock with each other, so if I place another one on top here I don't have to strap it down because the lower box keeps it in place. 
So the frame can fit quite a few of these things in different configurations. And as I said before, you can also use the top of the cargo cage. So if I place these sideways, I can fit even more of them on here. The slots in the boards below also allow you to install various kinds of webbing to create more of a basket. So here I'm using 25mm nylon strap material for that. And it's also possible to weave this so it's less dense, but I eventually went with a pretty minimal setup here because I keep the box on the bike most of the time anyway. Last but not least, besides the weight of the bike itself, which I answered last time, there's one question that keeps coming up with these builds and that's how much weight the bike can carry. Unfortunately, it's really hard to give an exact number for this because it depends on a lot of stuff and it's kind of hard to pinpoint what exactly constitutes too much weight. The limiting factor isn't so much at which point the frame starts to break because the bike is going to be virtually unrideable long before that point. So the question is really more how much weight you can have on the bike and still safely control it. This obviously depends a lot on your personal bike riding abilities and the kind of environment you ride in. But to give you a rough number, I've personally used this bike with up to 80 kilograms of cargo on it. And I think for most people that's about as high as you want to go, especially if you have to ride in heavy traffic, because the handling does get very sluggish at that point. A lot of people were also asking about the range. Again, this is pretty much impossible to answer with a concrete number, because it depends a lot on your riding style, how much support you're using, and of course the battery capacity. But personally, with this 20 amp hour battery, I can do about 100 kilometers with medium assist. But if you're moving a lot of weight or going uphill, or you're the type of rider who wants an e-bike to work like a motorcycle where the motor does all of the work, that number could easily be half as much. So again, it depends. So as much as I'd like to keep answering specific questions, I think the videos on my channel aren't really the best format for that. But if you want some more personal input from me, use just a reminder that I do have a Patreon page, which allows me to actually take the time to answer questions from members in a lot more detail compared to YouTube comments. So if you need some help with your project or just want to pitch in to help the channel, feel free to check that out. And with that, I think that's pretty much all I got on this project for now. So this video concludes the three-part series. I hope the additional info here was helpful for some of you, so thanks for watching and I will see you with a video on another type of vehicle soon.